everyone. So we, uh, us as a group this semester, focused on clean energy and innovation policies within three different sectors with the goal of the two degree uh, global warming target in mind. Um, and so the three areas that we chose to focus on are electricity, transportation, and carbon capture. Electricity and transportation alone make up around 50% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the US and the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released a report last year and they highlighted the role that carbon removal strategies are going to be playing in any scenario that we as women distribute. So we chose these three sectors because we believe that they offer the most opportunity for the reductions in greenhouse gases that we're hoping for and secondly because they offer the opportunity to implement um, politically and economically viable policies as well. So within those three sectors, we looked at two different kinds of policies. The first one being tech push policies um, that support clean energy technology through research and development, uh, pilot demonstration programs, and initial co commercial deployment. And then the second being demand to pull policies that governments use to do increase direct proc procurements and improve development. Um, and those have a, more, a higher guarantee for market adoption. And both of those t policies have the goal in mind to accelerate development and deployment. So the first area that we're focusing on is low greenhouse gas electricity. And to provide a little bit of context on this area, um, in 2018, greenhouse gas emissions um, were rising, but greenhouse contributed to around 16.9% of the total electricity generation mix. And so the target for um, 2050 would be to have renewables contribute to 55% of the total electricity generation mix, and this is going to require a large role in terms of federal policy. And we identified two areas in the energy transition that federal policies can play a role in. The first is development, and the second is integration. And so in this first stage, which focuses on development, technologies are still a little bit new, so policies are needed to kind of help encourage the development of the technologies and also to bring working concepts to market. And then in the second stage, which focuses on integration, Policies are more needed to accelerate development and incentivize usage, and so this is where our two policies come into play. All right, so when it comes to any technological push program, there's four major stage, stages that a uh, technological push program needs to go through, and each stage has a subset of specific funding that it needs to reach any goal it really wants to do. So when it comes to uh, R&D and initial piloting phases for a program like this, uh, uh, it's usually public or privately funded, but what they really face challenges in, it challenges in is in the third stage, which is initial deployment for commercial use. And um, currently, the, the loans program's office uh, under the Department of Energy has a total of $40 billion, which they have received from uh, either uh, their current uh, legislation under their presidency, or they do it annually. Um, currently, uh, for what this for for what this <laughs> because of this, the third stage, otherwise known as the value of debt, our first policy recommendation is to increase the Department of Energy's loan program loan program offices loan guarantees given to renewable and efficient energy projects. The loan program's office. Is, Receive the total that I that. So, in comparison to fossil fuels, um, the loan program's office gives $8.5 billion currently to fossil fuel projects, while it gives $4.5 billion to renewable energy and efficient programs. But the whole reasoning behind this is um, conservative push market demand for the uh, currently existing grid system that has already functioned off fossil fuels. So, the whole point of this is to increase the loan program's offices um, loans towards renewable and energy and efficient project, projects from 4.5 billion to, eight, to approximately 10 billion. This would be a percentage increase from 10% to approximately 25, and what it would do is help in, increase the distribution of uh, renewable energy and uh, other forms of resilient pro programs into the grid system. So as Carlos mentioned, um, one of the main roadblocks that we have identified is this difficulty of making renewable technologies market ready. Uh, but with the policy recommendation of increasing loans that the loan program office of 
the Department of Energy give, uh, we can really encourage development in renewables, improve the infrastructure and the interconnection, and as well as improve the technologies in the devices, wires, transformers that are required to integrate renewables. So traditional infrastructure, uh, uh, traditional energy generating stations are scattered uh, around the state. These facilities use oil, coal, or other, more recently, uh, renewable sources like wind and solar to generate electricity. Electricity is then delivered to the end user through complex transmission and distribution system, which is known as the grid. So this process happens seamlessly. If you flip on a switch, the light turns on. But what if something happens between the generating station and the, the, your facility and your home? So more recently, there has been increasing small solar farms, small wind turbines, and even combined heat and power generation like the one in Hawaii. These have become increasingly important sources of a supply of renewable energy. And these are called distributed energy resources, or DERs. DERs provide energy, of, provide energy that is affordable, clean, and reliable. They help business and communities to use energy more efficiently by creating it on site and storing its use at peak operating times. So the second roadblock that we identified in the sector is the accuracy of measuring how much the DER should be compensated. So currently we have the net energy metering system. It is a billing mechanism that awards solar system owners to uh, give back the electricity that they generate and uh, gets credits or uh, payments. So if you have a solar system on the roof, and it might generate more electricity than the house uses during daylight times. And you can give it back to the grid to, give, uh, to receive offset credits, or even pay extra for the extra money that you are receiving. However, as the renewable penetration rates grow and consumer demand changes, uh, this singular net energy metering system may not be as sufficient uh, it, because it does not accurately reflect the actual value of the net benefit of the electricity you give back to the grid. These benefits might include reducing emissions of pollutants, increasing grid liability, shifting load to avoid the need to operate more costly peak generation, and displacing or deferring the need for traditional grid uh, infrastructure expansion and upgrades. So this net energy metering fails to account for locational, temporal, and environmental benefits uh, that is associated with specific DER. And this is why we come up with our second policy. So for our second policy, we encourage states to replace NEM with a more comprehensive framework for valuing DER. And we recommend the value stack approach, which is essentially kind of what we already just said, is crediting owners that power their grid with renewable energy. And as you can see, we kind of just explained also of how this process works. And in fact, New York has already implemented the value stack, and it aims to account for the energy value, the capacity value, the environmental value, the demand reduction value, and the location system relief value. And we think it can be successful if deployed properly, but there needs to be further studies. And that's why we think that the DOE can actually help support states in this transition. And there are two ways that they can help. Uh, the first is that they can commission a study on DER integration, which, um, which will basically help break down uh, the impacts of DERs into different categories. And this way, states will have a framework that they can use to model their NEM replacement policies. And the second is that they can finance updates of infrastructures to improve transparency. And this will be things such as air quality monitors, time of use monitors, and other essential technologies. And finally, utilities will have a greater incentive to consider DERs in their planning processes under a framework that not only accounts for different benefits that these resources provide to the electricity system, but also compensates them accordingly. So just a few takeaways, while renewables are the fastest growing energy source right now, they still only make up around 16.9% of total electricity generation, and we need to have them making up 55% by 2050. And so in order to achieve this goal, we're gonna need federal policies that can one, play a role in addressing market barriers, and secondly, in creating consumer demand for renewable technologies.
Right, so our group was working on low greenhouse gas transportation technologies. Uh, so transitioning to a society where yeah, like clean energy is very important, but transportation is also very important because it is the largest emitting sector in the United States. Uh, many of you are probably more familiar with uh, light duty vehicles, that's personal cars that are electric, but we, what we decided to focus on was commercial transportation. And the three uh, technology, the three industries in particular are electric trucking, electric uh, freight rail, and aviation. Uh, one of the reasons, a couple reasons we chose commercial was because at the moment there's a lot of innovation happening right there. Uh, there are many technologies that are ready to be deployed that just need the necessary policy to get them to be implemented. Uh, of course, transportation is also widely used by many industries and sectors in the U.S. So by, by promoting technologies that are sustainable for the transportation sector, we're impacting many, other, many others as well. Um, so to talk a little bit more about the technologies uh, that we want to promote, um, we thought that these three that we picked uh, were going to be the most impactful in terms of technological advancement and greenhouse gas reduction. Um, so first we have electric aviation. Now the kind of technology in this field that we're looking at is going to be um, replacing short haul flights. So that's anything under 900 miles. Um, these aircrafts are tiny. They fit somewhere between 9 to 12 people. Um, but it is the most impactful uh, area within aviation that we can look at as short haul flights uh, make up over 50% of greenhouse gas emissions from the aviation sector in the United States. For commercial trucking, we're looking primarily at electric powered tractor trailers. So these are semi trucks that would replace the conventional diesel powered uh, tractor trailers that are on the road right now. And electric freight rail, most uh, trains yeah, that do freight in the U.S. are diesel powered, so we are planning on transitioning that to a uh, fully electrified system. Because of different uh, technological maturity levels of these technologies and also uh, adoption points that they all occupy uh, with electric aviation at the beginning and then followed by electric trucking and low greenhouse gas uh, rail transportation, they have differing points of legislative history. Uh, for aviation, there's very little existing policy. Um, pretty much the only thing that exists are private initiatives by entities such as Miami-Dade International Airport that has installed uh, charging infrastructure for electric aviation technologies. Um, for electric vehicle trucking, you have federal tax credits for EVs that were instituted in 2008. Um, these are probably the most popular uh, tax credits for electric vehicles um, that have encouraged you know, mass market adoption. You see this applied a lot with uh, Tesla those kinds of companies. And then lastly, for uh, low greenhouse gas freight, there's no federal legislative history, but independent states such as California have taken on initiatives to install uh, and subsidize infrastructure to promote adoption of these technologies. So in terms of policy recommendations, we broke it down into three separate phases. The first being tax credits. So we recommend providing tax credits uh, to commercial transportation companies in the sectors you just heard about um, that use and further um, electric propulsion technology. Um, this tax would obviously be capped, whether at uh, a time limit or at a capacity limit. Um, the second phase is infrastructure for charging stations. Um, we recognize one of the largest roadblocks in this kind of technology is making sure that uh, the infrastructure is available everywhere all at once. Nobody's going to buy an electric vehicle if they aren't guaranteed that they can make it from point A to point B and then back again. Um, same goes for companies investing in uh, electric aviation. Um, this would also help build grid resiliency um, and R&D in uh, further, electric, um, further electric research. Uh, and then our third phase is a military adoption requirement. Um, so we felt that this was an important area to target seeing as the United States government is one of the largest emitters of greenhouse gas. Um, so things such as fleet mandates um, and would incentivize research and development in electric transportation um, and would create a demand right out the gate for technologies like this. Due to the nature of e-transportation, there's a number, uh, well it depends on a number of tangential industries and also benefits a number of tangential industries. Um, so a few things that it depends on energy. Um, simply, if it's getting dirty energy, then e-transportation does not have the low greenhouse gas emissions claims um, that we would like it to have. Um, and furthermore, e-transportation has a huge reliance on battery technology. Um, so oftentimes the demand for precious minerals and metals that go into these batteries 
have detrimental environmental effects as well as socioeconomic effects in the countries in which they are extracted from. Um, E-transportation also has the potential to benefit in a number of tangential sectors, such as uh, energy storage, which of course contributes to grid resiliency, also encouraging battery R&D, uh, making more efficient batteries and energy storage in general, and also mitigating renewable intermittency problems, uh, therefore promoting more sustainable renewable energy sources in general. So just to give you a couple of takeaways for our group, uh, in order to, the policies that we're going to need to get these technologies adopted in the transportation sector largely rely on uh, subsidization and financial uh, incentives. Um, in order for these technologies to be adopted fully, though, there's also going to be a need for policy that improves the infrastructure of, uh, for electric vehicles throughout the country. Um, and finally, the, if, we, if these technologies are implemented and all these commercial transport sectors do adopt them, then that provides a wide number of tangential benefits for, um, for the United States and other industries. So even with the reductions in electricity and transportation energy use that they discussed, it's hard to imagine completely eliminating these emissions. So that's where carbon capture technology comes in. Um, the importance of incorporating carbon capture technology into climate change mitigation is increasing. For example, in the fifth IPCC assessment report, they determined that to have a greater than 66% chance of keeping warming between 2 degrees Celsius, 101 of 116 scenarios use carbon capturing technology. Carbon can be captured naturally through regenerative agricultural practices. However, we'll discuss the technical solutions. So the first is direct air capture and storage in which CO2 is absorbed from the air directly with filtration systems and separated with chemical systems. It can then be converted into a pure gas to be sequestered or utilized. Another technology is bioenergy and carbon capture and storage um, in which biomass is converted to energy and from this process the resulting CO2 is captured and stored or utilized. Despite the existence of these technologies, they are in the beginning stages of deployment. For example, there's only 17 BECCS projects worldwide. Most drawbacks to a more widespread implementation can be due to lacks of funding and infrastructure, and our policies would work to combat this. Currently, policies do exist to increase the viability of carbon capturing technology, however, less so than for transportation and electricity. One example is a demand pool policy, which is the 45Q tax credit. Um, this policy gives tax credits to projects that capture carbon for use or storage. Additionally, there are technology push policies, such as the DOE Carbon Capture Storage and Utilization Programs, which fund projects to be implemented at the National Energy and Technology Lab. Our first policy recommendation is to recommend Congress increase the 45Q tax credit for carbon captured for enhanced oil recovery. Although this may seem controversial, EOR is a feasible way to scale up expensive carbon capturing technology by working with the existing oil industry. The profits from selling oil could offset costs of research development and deployment to make future technology more widespread and cost effective. Once technology is used in EOR and its growth is enabled, it can then be applied to other sectors for utilization. Our second policy would work to overcome the roadblocks of utilization. We recommend con Congress create a carbon tax where the revenue is then used for transportation and storage infrastructure. These two policies would help overcome both cost and implementation barriers. So, um, enhanced oil recovery, also called tertiary recovery, is the extraction of oil from an oil field that cannot be extracted otherwise. Tertiary production of EOR requires the use of pure carbon dioxide, which has the property of mixing with the oil to swell it, make it lighter, detach it from the rock surfaces, and allowing the oil to flow more freely within the reservoir. And according to the IEA's analysis, uh, EOR can result in a net 63% reduction of carbon dioxide emission for every barrel of oil produced compared to the conventional oil production technology and reducing a total of 2,400 megatons of carbon dioxide, which is 80 times more than it's captured today. EOR will guarantee a high payback for both the governmental sectors and private investors since it can produce up to 135 billion barrels of incremental technically recoverable oil in the United States, providing a total of 45 billion metric tons carbon dioxide storage capacity. And recovering 100 billion barrels of oil through EOR technology will result in $8.5 trillion in revenues and economic activities occurring to the participants in the value chain, providing a total of $3.2 trillion to power industries. However, policy barriers still exist 
hindering instant application of EOR. And one of the most severe problems is the cost gap. And there is only $19 credit per metric ton of carbon dioxide used for EOR. But this does not cover the gap between the cost of carbon capture and revenue from selling CO2 for EOR, since carbon capture and sequestration costs $120 to $140 per metric ton of carbon dioxide used, which leads to $90 to $110 loss for every metric ton of carbon dioxide transfer. By the year 2040, this will result in a net $240 to $288 billion loss. Thus, we recommend that the Congress increase the value of 45Q tax credit to a level of $30 per ton or more by 2021, plus $10 per ton until 2026. What's going on? <laughs> Anyways, plus $10 per ton until 2026 in order to reduce the cost gap and also allow diverse uh, industries to jump into this market. Great, so even though EOR provides a market demand to meet the technology with where it's at now, we don't see it as the end goal for capture carbon capture technology. Um, there's a lot of other industries that have identified ways to use carbon capture. Um, some to highlight are the construction materials, provide the largest um, chance to reduce emissions through using captured carbon in those technologies. And then algae-based products have a lot of really great short-term impacts. However, because of the lack of affordable hydrogen um, that's required to purify captured carbon to make it usable, um, it's like another barrier. And then as well, there's a lack of storage and transportation infrastructure um, that exists to also make that captured carbon usable in other industries. Uh, so we've identified another policy proposal to create a carbon tax that will provide funding for the development of carbon capture and utilization and storage in other industries that would focus on storage and pipelines. Um, we do realize that a carbon tax is a heavy lift, so there are opportunities to also provide funding through other things like DOE programs. Um, and then finally, takeaways for this section of the presentation. Um, again, EOR provides a demand that meets the te technology where it's at for captured carbon, but we don't see that as the end goal. Um, it can be used to improve cost efficiency for carbon capture technology that then can make it viable to utilize in other industries. However, without developments in carbon capture and utilization storage infrastructure, those barriers will still exist. So that concludes all of our policy recommendations. These policies that we've put forth tonight are ones that are some of the ones that we believe can make the greatest difference in helping the U.S. reach its emission goals and keep warming below two degrees Celsius. Um, they uh, we've covered low greenhouse gas electricity, transportation, and carbon capture. What we hope you all take away from this is that we're going to need government policies to promote these technologies. Um, we, right now we live in, a, in an era where there is um, a groundswell of, of calls to do something about the climate crisis and our elected leaders need to uh, take the initiative and promote policies that support um, low greenhouse gas technologies, carbon capture and a wide range of other um, technologies. Uh, we'd like to thank Derek Sylvan for teaching this class for us. We, had a, we learned a lot and, and we had a great time doing so. Now, if there anybody has any questions for any of the groups, we would be happy to take them. idea but we also saw like additional or other sources of funding coming from DOE programs um, we just identified that there was a need for funding to develop carbon capture infrastructure and that was an initial idea
for the EOR. That was nineteen dollar per ton of CO two. Yeah, it's nineteen dollars per uh, ton of CO two right not, now. Yeah, so it's not the actual carbon tax that exists in the country at the moment, which is like forty. <coughs> No, this is the 45Q tax credit, not to be confused with the carbon tax. So there's your credit. Yeah. So, so when you talk about um, pipelines and storage for the car for the carbon you know moving the uh, CO2 around, uh, what kinds of things did you have in mind for lengths of pipelines, or where are these storages, or what? Where are kind of prime areas? I know you don't have a map of the plan, but... Uh. Yeah, so we thought the initial idea would be focused in metropolis areas, just because they tend to have more emissions, and then also could make it easier to transport to those industries where um, they've identified a use for captured carbon. Um, so we definitely thought starting off in cities was the way to go in terms of transport and carbon pipelines. Thank you guys.